Welcome to Not Your Ordinary Parts, a podcast where we talk about hard things associated with the human experience with the goal of increasing awareness, growth, and healing. You may hear information from professionally licensed therapists, life coaches, healers, doctors, etc. This information is not medical advice or therapy and is not meant to replace actual therapy or instructions given by a doctor or personal therapist. I'm your host, Jalan Johnson. My guest today is Amalia Tagakchen. Amalia is a licensed clinical social worker in Los Angeles, California, and the founder and owner of Untangled Path Therapy, a private practice that focuses on adults and couples. Supporting her clients using a multicultural lens over the last 11 years, Amalia's aim in providing therapy has been to break cultural barriers and replace them with insight and self-awareness. Amalia knows that it can be incredibly overwhelming to know where to start, what to ask, and what you need and does her best to help her clients navigate the tangled path and work toward a clear and untangled one. So Amalia, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being my guest. Thank you so much for having me on. And that was a beautiful introduction. So appreciate that. <laughs> well, I gave a, a bit of an intro about who you are and what you do, but so that the audience can get to know you a little bit better, would you mind telling us a little bit about your background and how you got to who and where you are today? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think you covered um, the big parts of that. Um, I I think it's um, it's always a it's always a tough question kind of to answer. It seems like it should be the most simple one, but um, I feel like the world of mental health and going into therapy kind of came out of a marriage of. Uh, personal experiences and upbringing, as well as just kind of what sound, might sound like a cliche, but being able to help others and um, trying to provide that lens, that clinical lens of mental health and break the stigma and normalize mental health and therapy. So being able to kind of bring that cultural lens, like you mentioned, and working to bring it to the forefront as much as possible for both personal and professional reasons, um, kind of, you know, kind of came about and, you know, 11 years later, here we are and the goal remains the same. So really happy to be on here and being able to continue to talk about that. Before you became a clinician, what, what was mental health like for you, um, culturally? Like, did you, did you go to therapy on your own or was mental health and therapy something that was talked about in your home growing up? Quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. um, in, and I think this is why kind of having that like cultural uh, competency and lens became critical for me personally um, to be able to kind of use it in day to day. Uh, growing up, um, so I'm Armenian and in, within, for the majority, I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna try not to generalize, but for the majority um, within the Armenian culture and in a lot of other cultures, mental health and therapy, uh, especially therapy, is not only incredibly stigmatized, but it's very, very taboo. So I didn't actually, it didn't actually pique my interest until around the age of 12, 13, so kind of around middle school, um, when I had um, kind of eye-opening experience take place with one of my family members who was succumbed to mental illness. And there was a lot of confusion surrounding that. We didn't know what was taking place. We didn't know how to be of aid. We didn't know um, how to seek out help or even seeking out help was something to do because that would mean that you would have to talk about something very, very deeply personal um, of your loved one's struggle and it would potentially come out as being misconstrued as a point of weakness. Um, it would be misconstrued and potentially open space for judgment from others, especially others who don't understand mental health as well. Um, so really it wasn't until around middle school where I kind of started to take notice of hmm, like how like some people appear to be struggling with things that we don't maybe talk about day to day. Um, and then of course, kind of fast forward to college, um, psychology was my 
top interest. And that led me to um, my degree in um, social work and ultimately becoming a therapist. So it kind of propelled me into that direction of trying to understand how the brain works and how, why certain behaviors are what they are. Um, and, you know, lo and behold, um, I'm just trying to understand what mental illness is, what diagnosing is, and how we can really still be able to function and be at our very best and do our very best, um, even though there are very, very real challenges that are taking place primarily cognitively and how that manifests physically and emotionally. Um, so I guess it all kind of transpired and propelled in that direction. And it wasn't until I was in my early 20s where um, therapy was, you know, brought to the forefront of, oh, this is something I could do myself. And of, of course, um, did that myself and extremely profound, rewarding, eye-opening. Um, and it just further reinforced not only my love for trying to help others and trying to bring mental health to the forefront, but um, the absolute need for it, the absolute need to talk about it. Mm. I agree. Thank you for sharing that. I do believe yeah. that there is a huge need for it because culturally for me as well, like mental health was not a subject that was, you know, on the table for discussion. It just wasn't. It would be, you know, oh, well, he or she is crazy or, you know, something like that. But it would be normal yeah. human issues that people would be suffering from, but they were just generalized into an area that was just taboo and gray and just wasn't to be spoken about. So I understand where you're coming from with, yeah. with your family issue as well. Yeah. So what are um, some of your primary areas of focus in your practice? So the big one is anxiety. Um, and, I, and I have yet to meet a single person who doesn't <laughs> struggle with some, some sort of um, either anxiety disorder, just anxiety in general. I mean, if you live any, anywhere on the face of this planet, chances are you've experienced some sense of anxiety, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, of course, um, it's, you know, it's a survival skill and it, it keeps us alert and uh, protect us but when it crosses over to becoming a disorder then that's when it starts to become problematic and hinders our day-to-day -day functioning um, so anxiety is kind of the big one that i see um relationships both working with couples as you mentioned and family relationships systems work um and a lot of um a lot of women's issues and as of late um perinatal mental health. So a lot of post, you know, postpartum anxiety, postpartum depression, working with a lot of moms, um, both first time moms and veteran moms, um, and kind of the juggle of life, um, prof professionally, personally, um, kind of everything under the realm of women's issues per se, and anything under the umbrella of kind of, um, perinatal mental health. So yeah, those are, those are the big ones. Mm. I mean, I think nowadays, Anxiety is just as common as um, a cold, you know, with, with everything that we're dealing mm -hmm. with. And then after the pandemic, and it just seems like everyone is anxious. And the, the age that we're seeing anxiety start is getting younger and younger because we have so many issues that we're trying to deal with without having the proper tools yeah. or, you know, having a an outlet to discuss what's going on and what's wrong. So our nervous systems are just getting overwhelmed. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think the pandemic, if anything, it showed us that it exasperated a lot of like, if, if you're already someone who dealt with anxiety, it, it skyrocketed um, yeah. and, and you're right on the nose of it starts younger and younger. And I think that that probably didn't help, um, especially with a lot of kids having zoom classes and kind of what that looked like behind the screen and being away from their friends and that you know the social connections um the the everything the unplanned and unknown uh it, it certainly didn't help so we did we saw uh, a, a tremendous a tremendous amount of um teenagers and young adults just struggling with anxiety since the pandemic what are some signs that would indicate that someone should prioritize their mental health like if, if someone is, is maybe feeling anxious, but doesn't know how to put a name to that or just um, 
behaviors that someone could see in themselves or in someone else that they could pinpoint and say, okay, well, maybe I need to, to focus on my mental health or maybe I need to talk to somebody. What, what would you say some of those indicators or signs would be? You know, some of them, um, some of them can be extremely subtle and some of them can be pretty blatant and obvious, but I would say first and foremost, if there's anything taking a place that makes your day-to-day functioning harder, and this is actually kind of one of the like key diagnostic criteria is when you're kind of looking through a DSM and you're trying to, um, you know, it, it, it's black and white per se, and there are lots of shades of gray, but um, one thing that like certainly follows through and through is anytime anything gets in the way of your day-to-day functioning and hinders your relationships, your um, professional capacity, your personal capacity, your ability to carry out your regular responsibilities. You know, you wake up in the morning, let's say you have work after work, let's say it's family time, after family time, it's personal hobby, whatever the case may be, if those start to become significantly harder for a long duration of time and it starts to feel progressively difficult to carry out things that seem pretty regular, like sleeping, your sleep starts to become um, hindered. Let's say you're either sleeping too much or you're sleeping too little. So you're either dealing with um, insomnia or something like as basic as eating, you, you're either your appetite goes away or you're eating too much. The very, very core, ba- our basic foundational um, things that we don't even think twice about, if those start to become impacted, um, it's really time to start to take notice. Um, something else that comes to mind is lack of interest, um, which kind of seems almost like kind of like common sense or almost like silly, but if you're waking up in the morning and the things that you used to be interested in for again for a long period of time seem like they no longer interest you and you can't find the joy that you could find in everyday things like listening to your favorite song or watching your favorite sitcom or spending time with the people that you love and care about and who who truly bring you the sense of joy and fulfillment if that starts to change to the reverse and now it becomes a sense of anxiety, dread, it brings you sadness more than it brings you joy. Um, these are kind of like the more subtle ones to look out for um, that you may, you may not even notice until maybe somebody brings it to your attention. A lot of people start isolating and withdrawing again, that distancing from loved ones and um, kind of not behaving like your quote unquote typical self or if someone starts to describe you as kind of being out of character. Um, these are things to look forward to because again, sometimes they're so subtle that we don't realize it but if you're eating and you're sleeping is off if your level of interest in something changes drastically over a large course of time um or um there is some a lot of people complain about having like sudden fatigue or headaches just kind of like inexplicable physiological uh, like um very subtle physical changes that you know let's say you you weren't really working out or you didn't lift anything heavy but you continuously feel fatigue you continuously feel tired even though you've gotten plenty of rest if anything you slept more than eight hours but but you just can't seem to find an explanation um sometimes even things like that where physical symptoms like come out of nowhere it's important to pay attention to those if they accumulate this could be a, a big sign to start paying attention to your mental health because that's probably what it's going to end up pointing to. Wow. Uh, those are pretty subtle. And I, I didn't, I, I don't think I've ever made the connection between those things. I, I mean, something, it, well, clearly it's a disconnect. It's a disconnect if, if those things are happening, but yeah. I don't think we would attribute those things because they're kind of small to our mental health. Um, and some may, yeah. um, but for the most part, like, you know, I would just say, you know, I'm kind of off. I don't know what's going on. And I would just probably keep it moving until things got better. Mm-hmm. Um, and they may not get better. And then that would just become, you know, my new normal. And, and it's funny because <clears throat> as a as a guy, you know, we kind of say that, that guys are just oblivious to going to the doctor if we have an injury or something, right? So like if I hurt my arm, I'll be like, yeah, uh, I'll give it a while, right? <laughs> you know, and then months <laughs> later, I'm like, okay, it's been, you know, like eight months and my arm is still hurting. I should probably go see a doctor. So 
thinking about that, I, I, I feel that I would probably apply that same logic to having a, a small shift in my mental health without knowing why or, or what to do. Um, and yeah. then something that I thought about when you, you talked about our daily routine being off, I got a mental picture of like traffic flow. And if normally the highway is, you know, flowing fine, there's no backups or anything, there's nothing really to think about. But if there is an accident, traffic is backed up and we have now have to find a detour or, you know, it, it slows things down from from how they would normally operate or how they would normally flow. And that was what I thought about when um, you mentioned some of those things about mental health and prioritizing what signs we should, you know, we see or are looking for. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, there, there have been times for myself personally where I've tried to make like to-do lists mm -hmm. and just the sheer number of items that I have on my list became very overwhelming. And I've had a number of clients describe the same. And of course, lo and behold, it's, it's led to um, something under the umbrella of anxiety and just feeling so incredibly overwhelmed with just the idea of writing the things down that you have to do, which again, seems so, seems so mundane. It's what you most, most of us do every day. What's our pull up our calendar, look at our busy lives. What do we have to do? Drive from here to here, um, do this and that, pick up the kids, whatever the case may be. And just that idea of creating a list feels so daunting and overwhelming. And if that continues to be the case where all you feel is that sense of like dread and heaviness and feeling completely overwhelmed, probably something there to look at. Yeah. Right. And sh I don't think you should wait eight months to <laughs> go get your arm looked definitely up. not <laughs> I, eight months i would say is, is a little too long <laughs> but it's funny that you mentioned um you compared the physical with the mental health and, and i and i bring up this analogy a lot where uh you know it typically if a body part hurts or some you know you, when you break a something or something gets cut and you you know you need medical attention that one's you know it's visible it's it's kind of easy to see um you know, we'll, we'll use yours as an anomaly of it, waiting the eight months of being, I'm going to power through this, <laughs> something will heal eventually. Um, but most people can say like, uh, looks like you got something to fix there. Like you're bleeding and you got to take care of that. Go see a doctor. But the reverse happens with mental health where it's not visible more often than not, it's invisible. And we are fantastic at hiding mental health issues because we've grown to become really good at it. So that, per, that example of becoming extremely overwhelmed where you're creating a to-do list, if anyone were to look at that, I don't think they would think twice about it. They would just look like, looks like you're just kind of stressed out, like shake it off. <laughs> exactly. um, but it may be more than that. Why do you think, and I love the way you said we've become fantastic at avoiding things. Mm -hmm. Why do you think so many people um, hesitate to ask for help? Mm -hmm. A number of reasons um, come to mind, and the most prevalent seems to be not about the actual person themselves, but about uh, the person who they're trying to ask for help from, whether it, it, any sort of loved one, friend, family member, colleague, whoever it may be. Um, they feel like a burden. I, I can't. I. I mean, I, I can't tell you enough like how how often I hear that the reason why some people don't ask for help is because they feel like they would burden whoever it is that they're going to. Um, to not add something else to their plate. So, uh, it, you know, hearing that, it, it kind of breaks your heart. It's like, well, you're you're going through something, you're, you're struggling through something, there's something deeply that's that's, that's impacting your, your day to day and you, you aren't at your healthiest, but you don't want to place that burden on somebody else and, and ask for help. Um, that's been one of the biggest one that comes up. And typically my go-to is um, if you knew your loved one, was struggling and they were going through something extremely challenging and you knew <laughs> that you could help them, would you label them as being a burden to you if they came to you for help? Almost every single time guaranteed, no one would call their friend or family member a burden. No one would once say like, you're incredibly burdensome to me now that you brought up the fact that you may or may not be going through something. Um, and having kind of that shift in perspective and that like, being able to f look at it from that lens of somebody else's shoes, you're almost like knee jerk reaction is no, I, I, I want to help them. I want to, be, I want to know what's going on. Um, so, you know, if 
for anyone listening that feels like a burden, um, you're probably not. <laughs> you probably want to help the person who knew, you knew that was struggling. Um, that's one of the big ones that that comes up. Um, and quite honestly, the other one is just lack of information and not knowing who to like how to ask for help. Um, and sometimes that comes with a heavy dose of underlying shame, guilt, um, being labeled as weak. I know a lot of my um, my male clients, a lot of them I, I quickly are to say like, I'm, I'm a man, I'm, if I'm observed as being weak, um, then, you know, what would my spouse think? What would my kids think? They look up to me. Um, and it, it's a lot of these preconceived ideas of if you ask for help, therefore you are weak. But in my opinion, and I wholeheartedly believe this, uh, a big part of being vulnerable, which of course, opens the door for potentially being labeled as um, something that is shameful or you feel or being labeled as weak, being labeled as anything other than, oh, you, you can't handle something on your own. Um, it, it, of course, that level of vulnerability of being able to ask for help, you risk that. You always, always, always take the risk of being perceived in a way that you don't want to be looked at. But more often than not, that's usually the first and most important step in being able to say like, I'm going through something and can you help me or can you direct me into the area where I can seek out help? Um, but that, 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 that very difficult. And I know it's such a struggle for a lot of people making yourself vulnerable to the judgment and being stigmatized and, any any other um, very strong opinions of others who either don't understand mental health or fear it themselves or, or um, any anything else that's kind of like a biased opinion, um, it, it does hinder anyone from asking for help because they just don't want to be perceived as certain, in a negative light. As you were describing that, um, I'm a, a paramedic, and when we get someone who calls 911, a lot of times um, they call because they're scared. And when we get there, you know, we take their vital signs and they may be okay, but they may still need to be seen by a doctor. And a lot of times they just want reassurance that they're okay, but they don't necessarily want to go to the hospital. And we'll say, you probably should go and they'll feel like sometimes I've seen, well, I don't want to go because I don't want to be a burden to somebody, or I don't want my family to worry or be stressed out. And I'll sometimes what we'll have to do in order to convince them to go is to say, you know what, if you were my mom, if you were my dad, if you were my grandmother, I would tell you to go. I wouldn't let you stay here. And yeah. I, I think that just feeling like you're putting someone else out will prevent us from doing self-care or taking care of something that is maybe not necessarily emergent, but we can kind of, you know, keep at bay until it becomes a problem. And I think a lot of times we will continue to put something off until now it's an emergency instead of taking care of it while the, the issue is still small. Um, and I, I don't know why we do that as people. Um, a lot of times it feels like we've become so accustomed to saying, I'm fine. If someone asks us how we're doing, that it's more so a knee jerk reaction than actually telling the truth. Um, do you see that a lot? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I like anytime you ask anyone, it's kind of just becomes regular rep part of your repertoire to be like, how are you doing? I'm fine. Even though they're, they're, they're deep, they've had like two panic attacks in the last right. week and things are falling apart and their stress is skyrocketing and they're not sleeping. But um, it's really easy to say I'm fine because, you know, either you're not ready to address it, which is a huge part of it. Similar as you know, like, going to therapy like you you need to be ready like there's that level of readiness to be able to sit with it because it's so wildly uncomfortable mm. to bring all of that and unpack it and bring it to the forefront so it's a lot easier to say I'm fine you can keep you know ignoring it and deflecting it and that becomes really really easy to do because 
the the alternative is extremely hard. Looking at things, unpacking it, it's it's tough. It's tough to make it real. The second you say it out loud, it becomes real, right? Right, right. I wonder where that began and, and like where we decided to just keep stuffing things in a box instead of, mm -hmm. you know, like if there was one person 500 years ago who was the first one to do it. And then, oh, no, this is how we're going to do it. It just kept <laughs> escalating, you know. And then once the box gets too full to where you can't put anything else in it, now it's a crisis. Instead of right. dealing with one thing right. at a time and then, you know, maybe we put it in the box and we address it a day or two later and then we take it out so that we we create room so the box doesn't become so stuffed or so full. Um, but yeah, like like you said, Absolutely. the response, I'm fine. It, I don't even think it's it's more of a, a response, like an auto responder to an email when you're out of office than even considering the question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, that happens so Yeah, often. because, um, you know, in, in yeah, especially, uh, you know, I can only speak really more so to the Western culture, but, you know, there is such a high expectation for our our day-to-day -day functioning and responsibilities and what we're supposed to be doing and so much of that is individualistic it's figure it out on your own do it on your own you got a problem google it you got you got an issue like figure it out yourself like um and there you know there isn't a shortage of accessibility again speaking to the western culture of so many avenues where you can technically like do it on your own and therefore you're fine and keep stuffing it in because you just got to figure it out yourself and go 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 you know our lovely hustle culture and just got to do it got to keep moving got to keep making money like all of that and it's a lot easier to say i'm fine let me keep doing what i have to do to live not healthy <laughs> um versus saying like actually yeah i i need to hit pause which might mean I might burden somebody as a result of doing this. I may not show up to work and therefore my, my productivity might take a hit or I might show up, not be able to show up for my kid's dance recital and, and therefore I might not be present. But if that means that you took the time to take care of yourself, chances are you're probably gonna be more present for your kid's future dance recitals than missing that one or two. Like if you're just gonna show up as your better self, as a healthier version of yourself and therefore model that for them as well. Not to go off on a tangent, but a lot of, you know, you see this a lot with parents of trying to take that step of I'm going to be selfless, put my kids first, which is fantastic. It's wonderful. As a parent myself, I get that. But what you're modeling ends up hurting in the long run of if you ignore, if you don't take care of yourself, if you don't model what taking care of your mind, especially in a healthy way means, um, then, you know, how can you be present for them and be able to lead by example and be able to look at what like a healthy parent, you know, looks like. Um, so it's, I, you know, I can, I, I hear that comes up a lot of, you know, the kids first, the kids first, or my spouse first, or my, my elderly mom first. Noble, understandable, completely, completely understandable. Um, you can do that and <laughs> not a but. And I was trying to be careful with my words there because I think something else that we do is we, we like to live in this all or nothing territory of I'm either there for my elderly mom, you know, who's has five to six different type of illnesses that they're going through. So now I have to take care of them or I take care of myself. And I know it's a easier said than done, but it could be an and versus an or. It's I can take care of my elderly mom who I love and I, I know that she needs the help. So I need to be more present. I need to shift things around to be there for her. And I can still make it to the gym for 20 minutes instead of the hour that I usually go because I know that's going to keep me going for her. I could be there for her longer and do more for her if I if I can continuously take care of myself as well. And that includes things like your mental health and understanding what those signs are to look for. Went off on a tangent there, uh, but yeah. Um, yeah. Two things yeah. can coexist at once. And you can't pour from an empty yeah. cup. Um, you know, like if you want to be such a good parent and do so much for your kids, so you burn yourself out trying to be there for them and go to, you know, all the recitals and all this and all that. But then you're in the hospital when they graduate because <laughs> by doing so much, 
you've now basically, you know, burned the candle at both ends to the point to where you you're no longer able to function because you haven't done any self care in the process of trying to care for others. Absolutely. Which Trying to start it better myself. Pouring from an empty cup is one of my go-tos. And it's funny, I kind of reserved myself from not saying it because I say it so often. I get teased for saying it so often. But it's just true. Yeah, it <laughs> I is. say it because it's true. So I'm glad you said it instead of me. <laughs> Another one is, um, I remember my, my therapist told me this is, if you're on an airplane and there's a problem and those masks drop down, what do they say to do? And it's put on yours first that you can help others. And then I, I remember my first mental picture of that. And I was like, wow, like how stupid would I look not putting my mask on to then be able to help others? Because I can only do so much if, if there's no oxygen. You know, I maybe have a couple yeah. of minutes, but if I put that on, now I can do whatever I need to do for, you know, the duration of the emergency or, or however much time is needed to help other people. Yep. Wow. Um, it's like you're in my head. So that's great. <laughs> that's my like other go to <laughs> analogy that I use. It's true. It's if you're passed out on the plane. Chances are you're not doing much helping. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. And one thing you mentioned was mm -hmm. um, expectation. And I think that that is a, a big thing because we think about what we are supposed to be doing or what others think we should be doing. And that molds how we function and how we operate, but expectation really holds no, no weight if you're not taking care of yourself. So if, if you think someone thinks you should do this and by doing it that way, and especially if you don't communicate what the real expectation is, you're, you're kind of setting yourself up for failure. 100%. And some, so much of those expectations typically are um, just assumed. Um, I can't tell you the number of couples I've had mm. sitting across from me where they would say something of like, well, I, I wanted to do this because I thought. And then the second they finish their sentence, their their partner is looking at them like, what do you like? What do you mean? Like, I, 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 I would never think that or I would never say that and it just becomes this like eye opening experience. I would never expect this from you. But the assumption of I'll use a completely cliche example of like, you know, dinner is supposed to be on the table or like you didn't wait to eat with me or you know I expected you to tuck in the kids at night because I came home from a long day of work. you know whatever the case may be it's these assumed expectations that um, keep us going and have these almost at times unrealistic standards that we set for ourselves that no one else is setting around us that we just uh, go 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 and like you mentioned earlier um, we live in a complete burnout society. I mean, that's that's becoming more and more of our culture. It's a marriage of almost like burnout culture and hustle culture. And we we think we thrive on it, but it's very, very much hurting us. <laughs> it's hurting our mental health ex exponentially. I think something that is somewhat similar to expectation, maybe values, and in, in your opinion, um, what do values have to do with mental health? It's um, values. It, it's it's funny. It's not this like hot topic that comes up in mental health, but I, in my opinion, I think it's it's pretty um, critical uh, in the sense that, in my opinion, values are kind of like our framework. They're our north star. It's very very deeply rooted beliefs and principles that lay the foundation, lay our framework and, and govern our day-to-day -day choice and kind of how we see the world. So um, that's what I mean by it's our North Star. It kind of carries us into the directions um, that we need to go. And, you know, some of the people who feel like they're at their healthiest, especially mental health-wise, um, and feel the most like self-fulfilled, um, are the ones who are aligned with their values. So for example, if a few of your values are loyalty, trustworthiness, um, family, being present, uh, just anything, you know, then these are, of course, they're, 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 health, they're healthy values. They're values that say, you and I would argue would not be far from the person next to us. So if you're identifying 
being somebody who values trustworthiness and loyalty and family, um, but <laughs> your behaviors as, let's say, a partner, a spouse, um, are more so consistent or aligned with um, flirting or cheating as a sport, chances are you're not aligned with loyalty and family and trustworthiness as a value. So it, um, doing something like values exploration, which, which comes up, which can, um, some therapists focus on that. And, um, in acceptance and commitment therapy, ACT, they look at values a lot because if they say your behaviors aren't aligned with your values, then there's something to look at there. So if you can feel good about yourself and the decisions and the choices that you're making that subsequently lead to how you're feeling about you and about the world and what you're doing, um, then chances are you may need to take a hard look at really like, what do you value in life? Um, and, and it's kind of easy to say, well, I value family. Well, okay. Are you present for your family? Um, do you choose working over time and working on the weekends versus being there and spending quality time with them and creating memories and so on and so forth. So um, that's where I think values play a role is they really end up providing for, um, especially in the choices that you make, especially when you're faced with a difficult decision. I, I had a client who they're trying to get over um, uh, smoking marijuana and they've been smoking for the majority of their lives and they're just at a point where they want to stop. But, um, and, and they know their partner is, just they're not for it they want them to quit a lot for respiratory reasons uh, as of late as they're getting older and they've just been doing it for the majority of their life um and you know they they want to quit and we've been working on that in therapy and the way that we've been working on that in therapy so that it's within my scope is do you value honesty in a relationship so if you're telling me that you're smoking in secret and that you have a head tucked in a lockbox under your bed and you wait for them to go to work and then you smoke and then they come home and now you have to like sit with this guilt and shame let's look at that let's look at how much you actually do identify honesty as a value so we've been using that so like every time you have to think about if you want to smoke and you're you're trying not to and you're also trying to sustain a foundation of honesty in your relationship ask yourself is this behavior that i'm doing is the secret that i'm keeping aligned with my value of honesty or not and kind of looking at it from that perspective um has helped them in kind of like needing to stop and have this like sobering moment of no if i keep doing this then i'm lying to them and i don't want to keep lying to them and i don't want to keep lying to myself so i rather shake off this sense of guilt and shame that i'm now sitting with of not only lying to my partner but i'm lying to myself as this thing i want to do for the betterment of what i decide is good for me and I'm just not doing that. Um, so values can play a role in that way of uh, feeling more aligned with what we actually believe in and how we feel about ourselves as a result of that. Wow, that was that was super deep in the sense that yeah. we may value something, but it may be a value that's like on a shelf because yeah. We don't we don't align with it and neither does our behavior. So I I really was able to understand the concept of values and honesty the way you gave that example because you may say you value it, but if you're not doing the things to show that you value it, you don't really value it. It's just something that you talk about valuing. Yeah. Wow. Walk the walk, don't just talk the talk. Bingo. <laughs> said it. Um, no. So a question that I wanted to ask that was um, more in line with behaviors that we were talking about before is um, why can someone over apologize and how harmful that, can that be? Over apologizing comes up a lot. Um, it's being on the on the I'm sorry train for a long time, so much so that you may not even notice you're doing it anymore. Um, there are three, three big ones that come to mind why most people end up just being chronic over apologizers. 
Um, one of them is usually rooted in some sort of childhood trauma. And I know some people's eyes kind of glaze over and they, they stop listening the second they kind of hear like, you know, childhood trauma or um, doing parts work or he healing the inner self. Like it's, it's very real and it's very important to look at that. Um, it may be overused, but as far as how that connects with overly apologizing of, let's say, um, a young, a young adult or an adult um, is if when you were growing up, um, if you did something wrong, or even more importantly, if you didn't do something wrong, but you said, I'm sorry, and that kept you safe, mm -hmm. chances are you have now learned that if I say sorry, I'm going to feel safe. We see this a lot with anyone who grew up in kind of a chaotic home and not even necessarily uh, speaking to, to violence or to, to like a physical chaos, but more so an emotional chaos if you had, um, you know, unstable caregivers or if there was a lot of abandonment that took place um you know caregivers were kind of in and out um it set this precedence and this tone and more so modeled this survival skill of just say i'm sorry and you'll feel safe even if you didn't do something wrong so then that directly translates to let's say adult relationships where you figure out, okay, if I say sorry, then I'm not going to be hurt and I'm going to feel safe and I'll feel secure and protected and they won't leave me. And it very quickly kind of translates to that. And we just continuously say, I'm sorry, in hopes that you'll feel safe and secure and they'll still be there for us. So it's, it's a big one that comes up. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes it, and sometimes it was just modeled for us in, in kind of, um, conflicts really so if we saw that in conflicts again kind of almost aligns with the sense of safety and security um if you know you say i'm sorry you avoid a conflict and now you've just learned that you can avoid conflict just by saying i'm sorry so again you kind of ad adapt to this um need of saying I i'm sorry out of like pure necessity of i don't want to feel uncomfortable so i will avoid this conflict and just say i'm sorry even though it, it wasn't my fault to begin with. Um, and then, you know, for it, important and kind of aligned for me to look at it through like, um, through a cultural lens of sometimes growing up, it's just, um, it's either a, a standard or a custom. Uh, a, again, I hate to generalize, but sometimes for women growing up in certain cultures of, you know, it, it's very ladylike. If you say, I'm sorry, before, you know, you do something or you try to stay small and quiet and apologize, you know, for so-and-so and, and what you did and what, or what you didn't do, but say sorry anyways, because that's very lady. Like, so um, sometimes just depending on how you grew up and the type of upbringing you had, um, you become very accustomed to, well, it's, it's, it's very ladylike or it's very feminine um, and we want to continue with that. And in order to do that, a part of that is being very apologetic. And then, of course, that tends to carry over and you kind of chronically um, apologize um, when, it, when it's not necessary and when it's not your fault to begin with. What can that do to someone? And like, how, how, how damaging could that be to constantly um, get in the routine of staying small or avoiding a conflict, even if it's something that you may very well be in the right or there was no reason to apologize or what what can chronically apologizing do to you over time i mean I, I think it can very directly um impact your sense of self-worth um your the way that you know we perceive ourselves through a certain lens and if growing up you were made to feel small or you were taught that it, you know, you, you learned that if, if you make yourself smaller, if you apologize, even if it's not your fault, then you feel um, a sense of safety, then you're constantly going to perceive your sense of self-worth of being directly linked with, okay, if I, if I apologize, then I'm okay, and I need to do this, and especially, you know, in um, falling into traps of toxic or unhealthy relationships, that could be exactly what somebody needs let's say somebody with a narcissistic personality disorder to kind of keep that cycle going so having a very skewed uh and unhealthy sense of self-worth sense of self sense of self-esteem kind of all tied in together 
that's where it becomes incredibly damaging. So you're not really seeing your, your, the way that you're, the lens that you're seeing yourself through um, and, and your, your worth as just, just a human being in general um, is, is extremely, that's the right word. I know the word skewed keeps coming to mind. It's it's not the healthiest version of yourself, but it's the one that you were either taught to believe or made to believe. And then it could potentially be exactly what somebody who that benefits um, continue, continues to believe, um, which is something where therapy could be a great place to be able to kind of discover this and have this surface there and unpack and do a lot of really great work to... Um, undo it and to be able to you know have better coping skills and have better um identity do a lot of work on identity on what your sense of self-worth really does look like so it doesn't have to keep including being a chronic overpolarizer that's great thank you for that explanation um and mm -hmm. i think that we do get especially as children if we if we grew up in a an emotionally unsafe environment i think we try to manage or try to manage the um situations or adults emotions by apologizing just to keep them from being upset because if they were upset then you know a sense of safety was lost so apologizing almost became a tool that someone can use to make sure that you know there there's no arguments or no one's upset with them and things of that nature yeah so. absolutely all right, another question kind of off topic from what we were just discussing, but I think this is important. Um, what is secondary grief and how does it, what does it have to do with someone's identity? Secondary grief is typically um, grief that's experienced in response to the primary grief. So primary grief, uh, we all know it's, it's, it's a emotional and physiological response to typically the loss of a loved one of a significant person in your life. Um, an example of both primary and secondary grief would be if, let's say, you found out that um, a son finds out that his mother has a um, diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. So, you know, Alzheimer's disease, neurodegenerative disease that you know, consistently over the course of many years, slowly starts diminishing a lot of um, our cognitive abilities, our memory, so on and so forth. So you're looking at the loss of your mom because you know that the ability for them to recognize you and to know who you are, that's already kind of being taken away. So, so the grief there, the loss there, that's the primary grief. The secondary part comes as our experience to that loss and um, the role that our identity plays to it is you kind of, that, that example is you start to lose your identity as a son um, from that experience, that primary loss. And now you're more so, if anything, you're a caregiver. Um, you start to take on that role of caregiver and you lose that identity um, of a son in that, in that scenario. So we see a lot of this in um, let's say a, a mother who makes, uh, you know, the, the respectable and noble choice to stay home and raise the kids. But for the last, let's say, 20 years or so, um, they were a doctor their entire life. So it's this loss of having this identity and this, this career. So that you're experiencing that loss and you're also experiencing this identity um, as a doctor because, you know, you're your mom um, and you make that decision. and you no longer get to practice, do what you used to do in your career for the majority of your life. So now you're experiencing that and that loss of identity in there and being a doctor. I see. Um, in one of your recent posts, you talked about overgeneralization. Can you explain what that is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's one of many cognitive distortions um, and cognitive distortions are uh, basically another way of saying irrational thinking um it, it's um it's born out of cbt cognitive behavioral therapy and it's uh looking at you know our cognitions and our um you know how we how we perceive things 
with overgeneralization, um, it's taking one or really just a hand few of instances or moments or experiences and taking that to be the truth or to be the only reality of what future outcomes and what future experiences are going to look like. And then, you know, the worst part of it is you take that and you take the onus of that of, well, I'll give you an example. Um, let's say a kid's in a cafeteria and they're walking with their tray of food. Uh, they trip and fall and everyone's laughing. And now they've identified themselves as clumsy. So moving forward, fast forward to adulthood, they're continuously going to think of themselves as this, I'm always this clumsy person. If I hold anything, I'm probably going to drop it. Uh, and you're constantly like, you're, you're, you're scared and you're worried and you're identifying yourself as this, you know, clumsy person because you've now overgeneralized that one experience that you had to everything else that's going to potentially happen if you were to bump into anyone or if you were to carry anything ever again as someone who's not attentive and someone who's clumsy and you continue to overgeneralize and take on that um, assumption and that label, um, which you know, can feel really damaging. <laughs> mm. So that's, yeah, that's overgeneralization. I can see how that would work. Um, especially if you were maybe clumsy as a kid and, you know, you spill things or drop things that, that can really carry over into your adulthood and, and make you feel like that is who you are or, you know, your, your identity is a clumsy person and it would probably keep you from doing a lot of things just out of fear. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we talked about a lot and I think that we gave some good starting points for contemplating talking about mental health and someone being able to see maybe some behaviors that may need attention. Um, if, if someone wanted to begin the conversation, but now they start to overthink things, um, they could get stuck, possibly. What what could be some good mm -hmm. ideas or good tips on how to kind of put your mental health ducks in a row so that you don't seem overwhelmed or you don't get stuck? I, I think it's it's uh, completely natural to kind of get into that state of um, feeling stuck and feeling overwhelmed. You're like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna take that first step. I'm gonna you know look for therapists. Or I'm gonna try to figure out what my next step in addressing my mental health issues are. And therapy certainly not the only way. Um, but you know, one of the ways of kind of overthinking, um, almost like. <laughs> A, a quick tool that I like to pull out of my tool belt. Um, if you're overthinking about anything that could potentially go wrong, or if you do this, then this will happen. Um, or it, it could potentially have this catastrophic experience. So we do a lot of catastrophizing when we overthink and we think of the worst case scenarios that could potentially come out of something that's merely just a thought or the likelihood of it happening is so, so, so minimal. Um, so, you know, if you find yourself in a point where you're, you're kind of ready to go, you're ready to get all your ducks in a row, like you said, um, but you start thinking about, well, if I do this, then this might happen. And then somebody will find out and what will they say? Could they judge me? And so it, now you've talked yourself out of trying to do the thing that was good for you to begin with. And you've kind of catastrophized the situation, which is just one of the ways of overthinking. Um, one question that I like to ask is kind of like, well, if you played out this whole worst case scenario of it feels so real that when you do a, it's going to lead to B, kind of like ask it, well, what, where's the evidence to that? Like, where's the evidence that you can show me that if this happens, then this will happen. And typically when we get into that state of overthinking, we've already created this, this narrative and this story that feels so real to us, even though it's a complete hypothetical. And if we talk ourselves out of doing something because we have convinced ourselves that this hypothetical is going to happen. So if you can't point to the evidence of, let's say, the worst case scenario happening, chances are it's probably not going to be so bad. And usually it's not. So if you're kind of feeling ambivalent or anxious, just overall hesitant about kind of taking that next step and you kind of picture like that worst case scenario to take place, ask where the evidence is. If you can't point to it, 
try it out anyways. What if someone was to say, um, well, you know, I'm aware of who I am and, and what I do. Is that really giving themselves an opportunity to heal or could they just be coping? Like, is there a difference between healing and coping? Yeah, absolutely. Um, they're both, they're both important. Um, coping is working on a lot of the, almost like the, the surface matters. Um, so let's say if you're anxious, um, well, we'll go back to the analogy of, um, chronically apologizing because I think that's a great one. So if you cope with, let's say you're going in for like, I really want to try and, and not apologize, then, you know, somebody can give you tools which would help you cope, like how you can change your responses and your dialogue instead of apologizing and reframe that and have a different response. And now you're slowly learning with coping tools how to stop chronically over apologizing. But compared to healing, which is where a lot of the nitty gritty kind of deeply rooted work comes in, which usually takes longer and a lot of work, um, at least in therapy to kind of un unpack that and process it. Um, we then kind of want to look like, well, where do we think that potentially this over apologizing came in and uh, hypothetically is, is to carry on with this example, um, you know, we can look at potentially you've developed, um, a anxious attachment style, which, you know, I, I know that um, attachment theory and um, attachment work has been in the spotlight for, for quite a while now. So hopefully this resonates with some, but um, you can kind of do that healing work to look at, well, where did this anxious attachment start from? And let's look at the caregivers. Let's look at your upbringing and let's look to see, was there a fear of abandonment here? Fast forward, is there a fear of abandonment in your present day relationship? And is that why you're chronically apologizing? So you're doing the healing work which could take a lot of time, but it's extremely worth it. And then you could also attach that to, no pun intended, um, you know, connect that with the coping skills that you also develop that you can use day to day on the surface. Um, so to answer your earlier question in a very long winded way, um, I think that potentially they could be selling themselves short because I think there is a lot that somebody who's hopefully providing you with a objective, non-judgmental, safe space, which hopefully is the goal of all therapists um, can do to kind of help you go that extra mile to see things maybe that you're missing. Um, so yeah, I think there's, there's absolutely, um, they absolutely maybe they're selling themselves a little bit short and maybe there's a little bit more <laughs> to look into there. I was going to say, if you start talking about attachment styles, that's a, a whole nother episode. <laughs> <laughs> that'll be round two <laughs> right. okay so last question um if you could use your sure. platform to encourage someone who may be struggling with what they now know as uh mental health um what would you say to them if they you know are, are on the fence about talking to someone about their their feelings or emotions I would say the first thing to do is to at least identify one person, um, whoever it may be, that they know that they can feel extremely secure and safe with and someone who they can feel, allow themselves to feel vulnerable with. Because that, again, kind of, as, as we talked about before, that's usually the first step in being able to say, I need help um, or I think something is wrong or I need it going through something as simple as that um but we do want to identify somebody that we feel completely our authentic selves with and someone who we feel completely secure with um i would say that would be the first step because you know it of course while we don't want the friends to be the person who let's say provides that you know clinical lens one that a therapist would they could at least be somebody who can hold that space for you that's so extremely important um, to then be able to say, you know, what, you know, what options have you considered or what, what kind of help do you think you need to kind of at least start that dialogue and start that conversation and validate for the other person who's asking for help and who's saying that they're going through something, 
now feel seen and heard and giving them that like, you know, get that like validity um, to them. So I would say if you can even find one person who is trustworthy and you feel your authentic self is with and you can be vulnerable with, start with that and just have a very transparent conversation with them in talking about, you know, what you're struggling with. And then from then on, it's a matter of finding the goodness of fit and finding what, what kind of um, help that you're looking for. Thanks. Well, Amalia, I want to say thank you for um, giving me your time and coming on to, to showcase your, your skill set and your talent and expertise. Um, I'm really grateful that you were able to do this with me. And um, if, if people want to find you online or on social media, where can they look, look you up at? Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, I love I love connecting um, with others on social media. Um, that's you know primarily why I started the page. Have some helpful content, hopefully, um, for anyone that you know purely psychoeducational. I think it's important to <laughs> remind that um, Instagram and other social media is definitely not a substitute for um, therapy or mental health, um, but purely psychoeducational. Um, with that being said, uh, my handle is. Amalia underscore talks underscore therapy. Um, you can find me there. All right. All right. Well, again, I want to say thank you so much for this, for your time. Um, thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you do. And thank you for how you do it. Oh, my gosh. Um, I, I can't express enough how much I appreciate the fact that you have created this platform and that you have people like myself who um, get the airtime to be able to talk about um, you know, normalizing mental health and trying to destigmatize it and demystify all the myths that surround it. So thank you so, so very much for having me on, truly.